Thank you, Dale. Good morning. It is an absolute privilege to be here with all of you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to, to visit with you here in Las Vegas and spend some time talking about a topic that I know everyone in this room is passionate about, and that's the future of agriculture. I'm excited to share with you our recent Farmer of the Future research, but before I do, I thought I'd offer a couple thoughts to you. And perhaps first and foremost, I'll say Happy New Year to you. I hope everyone had good holidays and has had a good start to the year. I know this is a good time of the year for me. I'm focused, I'm energized, I'm ready to go. Uh, it's also a time that's very busy in agriculture, right? We travel a lot and I, I'm no different than that. Uh, in fact, uh, I travel just, just about every week and I had the opportunity, my young daughter, uh, Abigail, always asks me where I'm going. And so the other day I said, well, I'm headed to Las Vegas and I'm gonna to talk to the leaders of the potato industry. And Abigail looked at me and she said, well, Dad, am I gonna to have to do that someday? I said, well, not necessarily. This is America, you can do whatever you want to do. What's most important right now is that you study hard and you focus on learning those sight words and getting your reading down and clean your room, listen to your mom while I'm gone. And if you work hard enough and you get as smart as you can be, then you can choose to do whatever you want to do. And it was clear that I had confused her because she looked me straight in the eyes and she said, but dad, I already think I'm smarter than you. <laughs> and if my performance in the casino last night is any indication, she might indeed be right. So it is an honor to be here. And I want to start by saying thank you. Thanks to each and every one of you for what you do, keeping agriculture strong. You put a lot of people to work. You keep our economies going. You feed the world. And whether you know it or not, you also play an important role in our national security. And we don't think about agriculture in national security terms very often, but I can tell you that I sure do because I spent the early part of my career studying countries that don't like us very much. And I can tell you that it is a significant competitive advantage to be able to feed our people, to feed our allies, to feed other countries' people if we choose to. And I know that about 26% of you are from Canada, right? So together, our collective national security is quite important. We should never underestimate the important role that agriculture plays in our national security and our ability to have a competitive advantage around the world. So I'll start by saying thanks for what you do for our industry, but equally important, thanks for what you do keeping our, our nations strong. So when you're a young intelligence officer, there are two questions that you have to be prepared to answer at a moment's notice. And the first question is, what's the current situation on the battlefield? And in order to answer that question, you gotta be a great analyst. You gotta have systems and tools and technology that allow you to see what's transpired on the battlefield. And you gotta have some knowledge that allows you to uh, put that action in context. But the second question that you're inevitably asked to answer is much harder. And that question is, what is gonna happen next? In order to predict the future, it requires both a scientific approach and I would argue an artistic approach. You gotta be a great analyst, but you also gotta be a student of history. You gotta be a psychologist. You have to have visibility of all the actions and reactions that have happened over time and how people and organizations respond. And I remember this lesson being incredibly clear to me early in my time when I was first assigned as a brand new second lieutenant to the 101st Airborne Division. A gentleman by the name of General Jack Keane, who was the commanding general of the 101st, walked into our tactical operations center when we were deployed, and he said, Lieutenant, what's the current situation? And I did my best to answer that I had prepared because I knew it was my turn to brief the general, and that can be both an opportunity and a tremendous risk, as you might imagine. 
for a brand new second lieutenant. But then the inevitable second question, what's going to happen after we air assault to these objectives? And we talked about how that battle would unfold. We talked about the ways in which our force would be arrayed at that point and what the enemy might do back to us. But then what he said became very instructive both in my army career, in my time as a business leader, and I think it's a perfect lens by which we should view this information that I'm about to share with you. He said, look, if we know what the current situation looks like, and within some margin of error can predict how our actions will be reacted to and then ultimately create a future scenario, then we can equally measure our actions, change our actions, develop different plans that yield a better result for us, that set the conditions for our success, that give us a competitive advantage as we move forward. And this idea of setting the conditions was an instrumental part of our doctrine, and it's become a very important part of thinking about business strategy and running our operations collectively. How do we evaluate what's happening today in the industry, think about the things that are likely to emerge in the industry, and then navigate that in the most optimal way for our farms, for our organizations, so that we have a competitive advantage when we get there. General Keene said, look, great leaders don't get to the future and then react to it. Great leaders create the future that they ultimately want. And so that is where I will start this presentation with this quote from Peter Drucker, that really the best way to predict the future is to create it. That's the lens I want to offer you as I move through a whole lot of data and insights. So what is this study about, the farmer of the future? In the military, you have this notion of the close battle and the deep battle. The close battle is what we're all engaged in right now. It's the battle that you have to win in order to keep fighting, right? The things that you're engaged with today. And I would argue that in agriculture, that we all have plenty to deal with today. And it's enough to kind of navigate through that and to feel like we've accomplished a great deal on a daily basis. But the deep battle is important too. What's coming next over the horizon? And in the Army, if you didn't consider the deep battle, what's coming next could be far worse than what you're engaged in right now. So even in the midst of the fight, you have to be thinking and training and planning for the next one. This study was born out of the belief that many organizations within agriculture weren't looking far enough over the horizon, that they were so engaged in what's right around them today, maybe making plans one year out, two years out, three years out, that there wasn't clear visibility of what was coming next. And so what we decided to do back in 2017 is when we started was to bring a collaborative group of industry leaders and organizations together to answer this very straightforward but complex question. Who are the farmers of the future and what will they require of us? What will they require of the industry, of the organizations, of the co-ops, of the checkoffs? What will they require of the input companies? What will they require of the industry in order to continue to be successful and to have a competitive advantage? And we went on quite the journey in order to answer that question. We launched the research in April of 2018, and we gathered in Chicago with a group of agricultural leaders, and we posed this very simple question. What's the difference? What's the difference between a farmer that sees success and a farmer that struggles? What's the difference between those that are growing and those that are just trying to get by? What are the internal and the external variables that seem to matter? What are the psychographic differences that seem to have an impact? And after that discussion, we came back to my company, Aimpoint Research, and we looked back through nearly 20 years of our proprietary research through that lens. Can we start to see what the variables are that maybe make a difference? Then we went out 
across the country. And we talk to farmers and ranchers like you and your peers and your friends and folks all across from coast to coast that represent different commodities and different views and different sizes and shapes. And we had that conversation. We asked them about their journey, about where they faced challenge and where they faced opportunity and how they navigated that differently. We did it in focus groups and in-depth interviews and one-on-ones and phone calls. And we took all that qualitative data and we brought it back. And then we did what's called a psychographic segmentation. And I'm going to share the results of that with you, which is a quantitative exercise where we interview thousands of farmers and try to use math to give us insights into how they might be different. That gave us an interesting view of the universe today, farmers and rancher universe. But then we had to put it in the context of the future, and we used a series of exercises called wargaming in order to visualize those future dynamics and to picture what their impacts may be. So I'm going to share that with you today. But before we jump into it, there's a couple other points I want to make. First is, there are a lot of internal and external variables that matter. And we wanted to understand both, which means you can have a farmer that inherits an operation and has the conditions perfectly set for their success. Good finances, maybe a good situation from a debt point of view. They got the right commodities in the right places, the right relationships, and they inherit that operation and somehow they make decisions that get them off onto the wrong path and they experience struggle. And then equally, you can have a farmer that goes from one challenge to the next challenge and makes excellent decisions, navigates through that, and ultimately prevails to continue to expand and strengthen their operation. We want to understand the interplay of the things you can control and the things you can't control to see how those journeys might be different. But before we jump into the future state, I want to just level set on what's going on today. And I think obviously you all know that better than anyone in the potato industry. But you also have other commodities that you grow. And I thought, you know, the Rabo Bank, uh, Steve did an excellent job of talking about some of the financial trade and uh, other dynamics that you're facing. But let me just level set here for a minute. As we spend a lot of time tracking ag trends, talking about how farms and farmers are changing, how technology is driving some of that change, how personalities and next generation dynamics play a role, what consumers are up to, markets and government. And we can spend all day talking about those, but let me hit just a couple dynamics that I think you all probably have experienced. In general, across most commodities, we're in a period where those commodities are experiencing some pricing pressure, generally. Na historic debt in ag country, and I, as uh, Stephen said, not a crisis necessarily, but I can tell you that in 2019, in the U.S., on-farm debt surpassed the 1980s levels, so it's at a, a historic level. Now, we got there on low interest rates and high land values, and so structurally, our debt-to-asset ratio is much better than it was certainly back then, but there's a whole lot of pressure. And nearly 60% of farmers and ranchers are experiencing some profitability pressure, some concern about making ends meet, and certainly some worry about their ability to not only make a profit, but to have enough money to pay on that debt. And so there's a lot of pressure in farm country. You may know that a third of farmers today are experiencing labor pressures too, finding it difficult to identify and secure the workforce that they need to operate their farms today. And even more are concerned about their ability to find the labor they need to operate their farm going forward in the future and to expand and to achieve their goals and plans. The regulatory environment in most states continues to get more complicated. A lot of states are navigating water quality issues, runoff issues, chemical application issues, and so a lot of farmers are feeling new pressures and new compliance requirements uh, in their home states. I won't in any way navigate uh, the wisdom 
of starting multiple trade wars at once, but we did. And the optimism of the farmer comes through uh, in the last uh, year or two as we've navigated these trade disputes. And luckily, USMCA uh, is off and running now. In general, farmers and ranchers have stuck with the president. The most it's dropped is a high of 79% of support down to 71%. So farmers and ranchers have stuck with the president through these trade disputes and negotiations because you're optimistic that what's going to come out of it is better for the, the farmer. And you may very well be right. I think there's a lot of good things on the horizon, but I know it's been a challenging road. And for a lot of folks in certain commodities, it's been extremely painful. We know that there's increased consumer interest in where their food comes from. No more understanding than there had ever been, but definitely more interest, right? More requirements being placed on the agri-food value chain. And some farmers feel a bit defensive about that. Why are they questioning the way we do business, the way we run our operations, the way we grow our crops? Why is there so much scrutiny here? And then we see consolidation all around us. It's not a new dynamic. Consolidation's been happening since the 1930s. The number of farms has continued to tick down. The size of those farms has ticked up. But a lot of evidence that that's accelerating across the country and across the region. And you see some farmers who are embracing new practices and new technologies and getting further ahead, and others who are under financial pressure that are falling further and further behind. So it's a challenging environment. I think we would all agree that across the country and the region, it's been a difficult time for agriculture over the last couple of years. You add to it these financial pressures that are confounding and resulting in the loss of a lot of farms out there. This is just a quick snapshot from the Farm Bureau showing the increase in bankruptcies across the nation, escalating in, in across all regions. There's a lot of farms out there and farmers that are struggling to make ends meet. And so what that adds up to is a whole lot of uncertainty. For a majority of farmers, they're looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. When do things get better? When do we get through this difficult dynamic and back to good days where we can predict what's going to happen? And the only thing we got to worry about is the weather and our decisions and we know within some margin of error that we're going to be successful. There's a lot of farmers feeling that uncertainty and wondering what's ahead for them. But that's certainly not every farmer. In fact, there's about 40% of farmers that are navigating through this very challenging time and seeing nothing but opportunity. Opportunity to get ahead, opportunity to increase their competitive advantages, opportunities to secure that land down the road that they've waited generations to secure. They're strengthening their operations, getting more market share, getting further ahead of their peers, and they're better positioned now than ever for what's ahead. So let's explore who they are. Who are these farmers and how are they different? I mentioned the qualitative research, and don't worry in the back, you don't have to read all this. I mentioned qualitative research. We went out and just interviewed farmers and ranchers all across the country. And we asked them to describe the farmers they know who are the most successful. It could be themselves, it could be their neighbor, it could be a, a family member. Who are the most successful farmers you know? And tell us what their characteristics are. And they said a lot of things, of course, and there, many of them are listed here. But they said, look, the best farmers, they're good leaders. They do a good job marketing. They capitalize on opportunities. They're not afraid to take risks. They change the way they do business. They're adaptable. They see opportunities in the market and they seize them. They use capital smart. They have a strong business acumen. They care about their quality. They're earlier adopters of new practices and new technologies that keep them on the cutting edge. They're willing to change the way they do things, and they have the foresight and the business sense to choose what to do and what not to do. They consider the ROI of the decisions they make. They have a long-term view. Sounds like 
a leader of any successful business, right, would have those attributes, farming or otherwise. So then conversely, we ask them, okay, describe the farmers who you know, who you would say are the least successful. What are their attributes? What make them different? And they said, look, the farmers that are the least successful, they don't adapt to change. They keep doing things the way they've always done them. They love the lifestyle and maybe the practice of farming more than they understand the business of farming. They're not good managers. They take their eye off the ball when it comes to quality. They don't put capital to good use. They're too conservative. They're short-term thinkers. And they often spend money before they really think about the long-term implications. Sounds like any leader of a business that's going to struggle, right? So this is in farmers and ranchers' words, and it was certainly interesting, but what we wanted to do was really understand it in a more scientific way. And so we did what's called a psychographic segmentation. And if you're not familiar with segmentation, there are lots of ways to do it, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But segmentation is a mathematical, a quantitative exercise. You've heard it described as everything from cluster analysis to using all kinds of different statistical approaches to trying to figure out how a universe has subgroups that are uniquely different from each other. And there are lots of ways to do it. We can talk about how farmers and ranchers may be different based on where they are in the country, geographically. Certainly some insights there, but limited. We can talk demographics, which at least Americans love to do, right? We love to stereotype and to put people into categories. And demographic segmentation would be all young farmers act this way, all older, older farmers act that way, big farms act this way, small farms act that way. Certainly some interesting conversation, but sometimes deeply flawed. And then there's behavioral segmentation, which many of the companies and organizations here could take on, and that is how do farmers interact with us differently? How do they engage in their transactions? How do they want to be served? Good insight there. But we did an attitudinal or a psychographic segmentation, which explored more deeply who they are individually, how they make decisions, how they think about the future, how they view their business, what their priorities are, and whether they have the innate tools to make the right decisions. What we do at Aimpoint from decades of segmentations is that no matter whether we did them nationally or regionally or across country boundaries or around certain topics, typically five personalities come to light out of the math and two of those personalities seem to always be outperforming the other three. So that was kind of our operating premise, but this segmentation was quite a bit different than anything we had done before. Because we were digging into things like IQ, business IQ, growth orientation, who do you trust, how do you make decisions, what are your goals, how do you navigate change, are you resistant, are you adaptable, who do you partner with, who do you trust for advice, are you loyal to brands, do you think about the long term, or are you completely engulfed in the short term? And what are the importance of the vendors and the relationships and the advisors that you do business with? So we really dug into about 60 different psychographic categories. And another thing that made this different, this was done last summer, or I'm sorry, summer of 2018. It was done in the United States only. We're about to put a national, international lens on it. But the big component of this research, this quantitative, is that we only interviewed farmers and ranchers who are 55 years old and younger, which cuts off a pretty significant part of the population. And we're not trying to be offensive to anyone in the room, of course. We have incredible amounts of research from those that may be older than 55. But we really wanted to focus on ensuring that we had the voice of the next generation farmers and specifically the farmers who would be operating in 2040, the 20-year horizon that we put on this particular study. And so let's dig into what we learned. In the math, five personalities or psychographic segments emerged yet again. 20% of them we call independent elites, and these are labels and names that we gave them 
in order to describe their personality, but I'm going to dig deeper uh, than the top line here. 21% we call enterprising business builders. 24% are the largest group, are classic practitioners. 22% we call self-reliant traditionals. In the smallest group, 14%, we call them leveraged lifestylers. And in any kind of mathematical exercise, you want to see somewhat of a normalized distribution, and we had that. But I'll tell you what makes the two groups on the left, the independent elites and the enterprising business builders, different. Lots of things make them different. But if you boil it down to just a couple that are really pronounced, their business IQ, their adaptability, and their drive to succeed are really differentiated with these two groups of farmers compared to the other three groups of their peers. They're also the farmers that are having the most success today. And so we started with the thesis. These are the farmers successful today. They're different than the rest. Will they also be the farmers who are most prepared and able to navigate the future state in 2040? We had to prove or disprove that theory, and we spent a lot of time doing that. But let me dig into the personalities first. The independent elites. If you're in the back of the room, the only thing that matters are green and red, right? Green is above average and red is below average. The independent elites, 20%, very successful farms and farming operations. These farmers are really at the top of the game. They're extremely secure in who they are and how they run their business. They are extremely driven towards growth into making their business stronger and better. They have high business IQ, higher business IQ than most of their peers. They're financially healthy and sound. And they're optimistic, in fact, extremely optimistic about the future of agriculture and their industry. They tend to be innovators, entrepreneurs. They're not enamored or stuck in the past. They would not consider themselves very traditional. They're not very reliant on farm bill programs or other things. They are different in many ways, but two ways that they stand out with this group and the enterprising business builders is that the independent elites invest their way to prosperity, which means they have a long-term view. They're willing to take risks in the short term to get a competitive advantage in the long term. And they also believe that their success is completely within their control, which means markets are going to go up and down, government regulations are going to come and go, presidents are going to come and go. At the end of the day, they believe that their success rests with them and that they're going to be able to navigate whatever comes before them. They've developed strong teams of advisors and collaborators that they trust and that have helped them get through difficult times in the past. There's only one number that I've circled on this whole chart, and it's succession planning. All of us in this room who care about this industry should be concerned that 51% is green, which means it's above average. The independent elites, 51% of them have succession planning. Now, why does that matter other than the obvious, right? Other than we don't know who's going to take over the operation for the rest of them. Well, what we found very early in the study is a very significant correlation between knowing who's coming back to run your farm or not. If you know who's coming back and you have a plan for it, and especially if it's a family member, you tend to keep pushing harder, innovating, changing, managing your operation more closely, looking to future trends and evolving in order to be prepared for them. This is a group that keeps their foot on the gas pedal more than those that don't. If you don't know who's coming back to run your farm, and especially if it's not a family member, you tend to take your foot off the gas pedal, you fall quicker into more traditional patterns, you stop innovating, you stop pushing towards growth, and you start to slow your operations transformation down, and over time that leads to less and less competitive advantages. Pretty easy math to make those connections. The independent elites, if they were an investment class, they would be 
the income funds because they keep performing no matter what's thrown at them and they're really at the top of the game. This next group, the enterprising business builders, I find to be the most fascinating group of farmers. And I know that human nature is to think about these groups and kind of put yourself into one of them and then you're probably thinking about others too. So I'll be interested in that conversation uh, uh, later on. But the enterprising business builders, 21%. This group of farmers are the most entrepreneurial, the most innovative, the highest business IQ, the most driven to grow and succeed. They are not at all interested in the way things were done in the past. These are the innovators, the ones that are shaking up the models, the ones that are finding new ways to do things, that are diversifying and innovating in new ways and earlier adopters of management practices in technology. This is a highly collaborative group too. They're looking for best in class knowledge and advisors and relationships that help them get a competitive advantage, that help them get ahead and get an ROI. Nearly two thirds of these farmers and ranchers grew their operation or expanded over the last five years, even in the midst of the challenges that we discussed. If the independent elites are at the top of the hill, the enterprising business builders are charging up after them to lead the industry. And we'll talk about how that success is propelled in the future. By the way, financially sound and like the independent elites, invest their way to prosperity, willing to put capital to work even at short-term risk to get a long-term advantage. And they also believe that their success is completely within their hands. No matter what the world may throw at them, they're going to find a way to emerge even better and stronger. The classic practitioners, the largest group of farmers and ranchers, 24%. They still want to grow. They still want to get better. They want to succeed. But this is a group that's starting to struggle. They're lacking some of the business IQ to get to that next level. They find themselves under a great deal of financial duress. That struggle has made them more conservative in their adopting of new management practices and technology. It's made them more traditional and quite frankly, they're losing some of their optimism about the future of agriculture. They're not quite sure where the light is at the end of the tunnel and what it means for them, and they're especially not sure uh, whether they're going to be able to succeed or not in the changing environment. Look at succession planning, drops into the red, 33%. This is a group who's less sure about who's coming back to take over their operation, and in some cases, they're encouraging those family members, maybe find something else to do. We're not sure that this is going to be enough for you to come back. This is a group that's desperate for help. And I don't mean desperate in a disparaging way. They're just looking for insight. They're looking for help. They're looking for a hand to get back on track. This is a group that's wondering where the light is at the end of the tunnel, when the government will step in. They're more reliant on those programs to get by. They're looking for a hand up. This is where the psychology changes in two ways. Unlike the previous two groups, this group of farmers don't believe that success is completely within their hands. The market's got to get better. Trade has to be opened back up. The government needs to step in. Something has to happen to help us get a, foot on, a footing so that we can move forward in the way that we always have wanted to. And the other way is they're really shorter term thinkers. They're not investing for the future. In fact, if anything, they've started to pull back on taking any risk at all because they're kind of bunkered in as they try to navigate through the storm. The self-reliant traditionals, 22%, an interesting bunch. These are farmers and ranchers that really aren't trying to grow their operation anymore. They're just trying to hold on to what they have. They're extremely conservative. This is a group that will tell you that we have farmed this way in this family for the last couple generations, and we'll continue to do it this way for the next several generations. Not at all enamored by new technology or new practices. In fact, 
They think that any of you that are adopting those new technologies and practices are probably frivolous, probably doing things that aren't really necessary. This is a group that never saw a dime on the, on the street that they wouldn't pick up and put in the bank. This very conservative fiscal approach has helped them weather storms in the past. This is how they got through the difficult times of the past. It'll help them get through the difficult times today and in the future. And they have saved a lot of money. In fact, they believe in saving their way to prosperity, managing costs, not trying to innovate. And they're financially healthier than the classic practitioners, but they're also not a group that's growing or really emerging uh, to be as competitive in the future, especially when I start to show you what the future looks like. This is also a group that tends to, rather than expand their operation, get that off-farm income or get some other monies flowing so that we can keep doing business the way we've always done it. Extremely change-resistant bunch of farmers. And then their final group, the leveraged lifestylers, the smallest group. This is a group that if you had a checklist for how to be a great farmer, they've checked every box. They look the part, they have the biggest equipment, they got the coolest stuff, they got the green hat, they've done it all. They've done everything you're supposed to do, and it didn't work. And they can't figure out why. They love farming, they love the practice of farming, they love the lifestyle of farming. The business should take care of itself. We've made every right move and it's not working. This is the group under the most financial duress. They've overextended themselves. They've got out on a limb. They don't know how to recover from it. And guess whose fault it is? Definitely not theirs. It's yours. It's everybody else's. It's the government's fault. It's the market's fault. It's my peer down the road's fault. It's the co-op's fault. It's everybody's fault. But it's not mine. I am extremely pessimistic, negative even about the future of agriculture. Because I did it right and I got dealt a bad hand of cards and now I'm in trouble. This is a group that is consolidating the fastest. This is the group that's rolling up the fastest. And here's one of the big revelations. These are some of the biggest farms in the country. In fact, in every one of these psychographic segments, there are big farms in smaller farms and medium-sized farms and within that range of age, older farmers and younger farmers, some of the biggest farms in this country are failing. And others that are smaller are emerging like rockets. It's not enough to think about this demographically. It's not enough to put people in stereotype categories. What we found is that the psychographics tell a better story, a more accurate story, across the demographics. What's interesting about these enterprising business builders, if you start to look across the indexing and all the categories that we've examined, the enterprising business builders are most certainly the most intense entrepreneurs, looking to shake it up. High business IQ, good use of capital, financially sound, finding new models, innovating, taking risks, open-minded. But there's some other things about them, too. If you look at the bottom right, second from the bottom, brand loyalty. The enterprising business builders, they're also the least loyal farmers. Now, what does that mean? This is not supposed to be anything other than that they are very ROI-focused. And that while they value relationships like everybody in the industry, if you're not providing them the best in class advice, inputs, data, technology, equipment, then they'll find somebody who will. This is not a group that's shopping for lowest prices. This is a group that understands value and they will make the decisions that give them the competitive advantage in the marketplace. But if you're an agribusiness serving farmers, like some of you who are enterprising business builders, and I would argue, that this crowd probably is disproportionate independent elite and enterprising business builders. You want people that add value, prove their ROI, and get you to the next level. And if they're not gonna do that, they'll pat you on the back and shake your hand like everybody else, but they're gonna leave you in the dust. And that's an important distinction. No matter what group 
a farmer finds themselves in, there's universal consensus that the industry is changing, that it's changing all around them and that you're going to have to be adaptable in order to survive and succeed. And some farmers are embracing it and some farmers are admitting that that's not me. I'm going to hold on as long as I can hold on and when the time is right, I'm going to get out or I'm not going to be able to pass it on to the next generation. It'll be somebody else's issue or land. Universal consensus that the industry is changing. So that's a quick snapshot of the psychographic categories, but that's not a future look, right? That's a look at the farmers and ranchers today. That's how they break out mathematically today. So how in the world do we predict the future? Anybody ever have one of these? You shake it up. The reply is hazy, right? We had one of these in our intelligence cell uh, back at Fort Campbell. And when the generals would ask something difficult, some of us would go over there and we'd shake it up. And it was supposed to be a joke. And we would laugh. And they wouldn't laugh. And that was the end of that. <laughs> no, we did an exercise called wargaming. That's how you predict the future, at least how we did it in the military. And it was an important exercise that we would go through before every mission. And that's where you bring the leaders of different units who have unique perspectives, who have expertise, and you put them all into a big room, sometimes a hangar, sometimes out in the field, and you run these exercises where you visualize the action and reaction of every step you're going to take in a particular operation to test your assumptions, to identify blind spots, to articulate the dynamics of the future and what will happen, and then you back up and you run it a different way. And you keep testing your assumptions until you figure out what's going to work and where the agreed upon future dynamics lie so that we can effectively navigate around them. And so we did this first exercise around the Farmer of the Future research in November 2018 in Denver. And we followed a framework called a PESTLE analysis, right, which you may or may not have heard of, where we explore the dynamics politically, economically, technologically, environmentally, certainly legal and policy and regulatory, and then consumers and social. And we used this kind of loose framework to make sure that we had a good 360 degree view of the future dynamics. And before we went to Denver, we interviewed over 50 different economists and academics and experts that represent lots of different points of view across the industry. And then we brought together the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, American Farm Bureau, nationwide. We had farm credit. We had checkoffs there. We had co-ops. Here's some of them. Uh, we had a lot of experts in the room. And here we are all camoed up in Denver to get into the mood and the spirit of wargaming. Looks pretty cool, huh? It's not really us, though. This is really us. <laughs> You're never, not quite sure, right? Not quite sure. So what we did is we broke into three groups. We had a grower team, a competitor team, and a markets team. And for two days, we navigated this pestle framework in sprints between today and 2025, and then to 2030, and then to 2040. And probably one of the most important things that should be mentioned is that we had growers in the room that represented these different personality or psychographic types to test their reactions, their actions, based on emerging scenarios. And so we would break into those three groups. We would navigate future dynamics with everything from economics to intelligence briefings. There'd be intense debate. And then we would come back around this table and beat each other up and challenge each other and contend for truth until the unified group agreed that these are the key dynamics of a particular time period. And so I want to share some of the really high level results of that. And I'll tell you that since we did this war game in November 2018, we just did another one in Nashville in 2019, just a couple months ago. And I'm going to, that was a, an alternative futures war game where this particular one was what we called a blue sky war game. And I'll share the results at a very high level of the Nashville one as well. But what did we find in Denver? Between today and 2025, no matter what economists we talked to back then, the belief was that the U.S. would go into and back out of a recession. They could all agree on that. 
Now, that's become a political hot potato. You heard an economist come up here today that say, well, we've mitigated it in the short term, maybe, probably this year, right? But the belief of the group was there would inevitably be an economic slowdown in this time period. How long and how deep really dependent on the dynamics of our country and how we respond to it. But there's equal distress across the world. Heck, part of Europe is in negative interest rates. So the belief is, is that there would be more economic challenge coming for our consumers. I mentioned the significant debt of ag country. I mentioned the financial distress around making ends meet. You know, a good recession can be good for interest rates. It can also hurt land values that's propping up some of that debt. The dynamics are uncertain of whether it could be good or bad, uh, but certainly a compounding dynamic to consider. The belief of the group in Denver was that the labor challenges that we're experiencing today would probably only get worse in this time frame, and that we would continue to fight and struggle over an adequate labor force. I know there's efforts in Washington. We'll see if they work. Uh, but at the end of the day, the group conceded that it would likely be a difficult period of time where we continue to challenge to find the labor we want. The third dynamic became one of the most important, and this is where I will argue that the potato industry is at the cutting edge. You're at the tip of the spear in this dynamic. Let me explain. The tightening, clarifying, and differentiation of supply chains. If you look at the next generation consumer, they want all the things that the previous generations wanted and they want to know that a brand or a food or a retailer can also connect on shared values. They want to know that their food is healthy and fresh and chemical free. They want a lot of additional things from the agri-food value chain that are more significant and harder to meet. The retailer and the food companies want to be able to make those claims so that they can connect to that consumer on those shared values. In order to make the claim, they got to make sure that their supply chain discipline all the way back to the farm and the inputs that went into a particular commodity. Stringent requirements that allow them to put something on a package that gets the attention of a consumer to sell more. They don't want to work with hundreds and hundreds of farmers. In their perfect world, these food companies and retailers would work with just a few who have the discipline and the vetted approach and the ability to meet their supply. In the absence of that, they'll work with as many as they need to in order to meet their supply, but they will impose pretty significant demands. Now, this is not news to all of you who sell to retailers and food companies almost entirely directly under those very stringent requirements. Livestock, it is also not new to. But I can tell you that across a lot of the other commodities, this is a new dynamic, where they're now in grain and corn and soybeans, going to have to have traceability and transparency and the ability to articulate every dynamic that went into and back out of growing that commodity and then providing it into the supply chains. These retailers and food companies, they're fighting over a share of wallet from a consumer, and they're going to continue to push each other to make better claims or more claims or more stringent claims that allow them to get a competitive advantage over another. And so this dynamic, although you all are, have been in it for a while, will continue to get more and more difficult to comply with. Increasingly tailored services for diverse farmer base, the dynamic that we see in consolidation is really a collapse of the middle. There's a lot of small farmers out there, a majority really, and there's even few at the large size, which we'll talk about in a minute, that are really at scale. And what we see are the farmers that are not quite big enough, but also not small enough to navigate through the difficult financial times under the most duress. And so you got an industry that's trying to figure out how do I deal with a million small farmers and about 60 or 70,000 at scale that I need to work with too. And how do we provide quality services and support to both? It's getting harder and harder. And then the, gr the group in Denver believed that at this time period, consolidation would actually accelerate and that we'd see more and more farms failing and more and more high-end consolidation. When you move forward another five years, so now to 2030, there's a pretty significant shift in the political influence. 
Now, whether it happens in 2020 or 2024, there's going to be a new administration, right? And the belief of the group in Denver was this country, at least the U.S., rocks like a giant ship in the ocean from left to right, trying to find equilibrium that it never really achieves. So the belief of the group at the time was the ship would rock back left a little more liberal and create more challenges perhaps for agriculture. It also focused, the group focused on the emerging national debt and that at some point in this time period there's going to have to be a real discussion about how we navigate it and how we reset. But the biggest dynamic of this time period was the loss of farm voices in Congress. As we see rural populations continue to decline, those districts are going to be redrawn this year. That will impact the 2022 elections. And farm country is going to have less influence in impacting how a particular member of Congress navigates uh, farm policies in the future. So the belief was that we'd have less influence and that that would start to make us vulnerable to more scrutiny on a lot of different components, whether that's GSE status or tax advantages for co-ops or regulatory types of, of policies. AgTEP, we see it doubling, ag tech investment every year. There's a lot of organizations, companies, Silicon Valley, that see that this industry is ripe for disruption and they're investing significant dollars into empowering you to make better decisions, to have more control, and to end around some of the conventional organizations that have been built in cross agriculture. This third dynamic, the rise of automation in the shared economy, it builds on what you heard from our friends from John Deere. The idea that data is king, and oh, by the way, a dynamic coming out of the Nashville war game was that data will ultimately be part of the product. It'll be merged with whatever that commodity is in order to create the traceability across the agri-food value chain. This dynamic of sharing data of autonomous will grow, and over the next two decades, the belief of the group was that we would see a changing dynamic on how equipment is purchased and run. And that equipment may become smaller, operate in fleets that are coordinated with each other without people, and that you could service areas really faster, more efficiently through the night even, and that you could operate your farm really by almost an Uber-like sharing of time on those platforms. And that it may be that farmers and ranchers won't have to purchase million dollar plus equipment in order to serve their farm over time. Consumers today already fully expect to have visibility of the agri-food value chain. They don't have it, but they expect to. And food companies and retailers are working hard to create that level of transparency all the way to the inputs into the farm gate. And so by this point, the belief of the group is we will have achieved that. And of course, there's significant changes in the world global infrastructure changes that will change the competitive set for, for all of you. By 2100, five out of the top 10 most populated countries on the planet are in Africa. Asia also continues to grow beyond China. Significant new markets. We also see Chinese investment in South America and in Eastern Europe and in Africa with their belt program to try to end around American agriculture. They are working on a chessboard that we're not even really playing on. And so we think there'll be additional competitive forces in the world that will continue to emerge, that will just provide challenges, but also opportunities for all of you. When you move forward to 2040, another 10-year jump, fewer than 75,000 farmers in the U.S. producing 75% of our agricultural output. So 75% of the value of our output done by 75,000 farmers out of 2 million farmers today. And if you really want to get specific, when we modeled this out, it's really 60,400 and some. Now, for those of you that think this is absolutely crazy, as we sit here, it's 105,000. 105,000 farms out of 2 million that yield 75% of the agricultural output of the United States. Huge operations at scale 
that change the dynamic. And what we see in this time period, and may, many of you may be already participating, we had some at our Nashville War Game Growers that are multinational farmers. When you serve a supply chain that needs a continuous flow, you start to think not across county boundaries or state boundaries, but national boundaries, so that you can grow your commodity year round. And the technology of the day will allow that type of operation. You probably already see them emerging. The belief of the group was by this point, agriculture's taken some hits. We've maybe lost some of the preferential treatment that we get in the tax code. Our co-ops might be struggling. The checkoffs may or may not even be acceptable at that point. And there's certainly some significant shifts in the farm bill. In fact, the group believed that the farm bill largely becomes a food bill and that there's significant effort to try to save rural America, which has really been continuing to escalate their economic struggles in this time period. Genetics and the genetic revolution will empower you with new tools, give you the ability to do more, to create specialty varietals, to grow things in places we couldn't grow them before, to eradicate some diseases, and to be able to meet very specific demands of the agri-food value chain. And of course, any inefficiencies that we see across the, the chain will largely uh, be worked out over the next two decades as machine learning and other types of algorithms really over, overcome uh, human input into the efficiencies of those chains. So a very different environment in 2040. So if you're a farmer then, technology has changed your game. It's allowed you to operate more efficiently. It's allowed to, you to operate at scale. It's allowed you to operate across even national boundaries. Compliance with supply chains, which you already deal with, is the most significant factor that any farmer in any commodity is going to deal with then. So you have a lot of your friends and peers across the country that can take a book out, a page out of your book and learn. But these very stringent requirements will become more difficult to comply with than any kind of state or federal regulation. And that that's really becomes the, the most important part of your daily work. And thinking about compliance, it also is an opportunity for you to position your farm as providing something unique to these omni-channel supply chains. And you see that happening where farms are branding and then offering a unique varietal to the industry that allows then that retailer or food company to make a claim. You all are somewhat participating in that now. So this becomes a table stakes type dynamic in 2040. We talked about the genetic revolution and what that means. We have a very consolidated agri-food value chain and one that uh, demands greater efficiencies that allow consumers to get what they want and continue to pay more or less, I'm sorry, less of their disposable income for food, which they've been on that trend for a while. So this is an interesting environment now that we find ourselves in, and what are the impacts for farmers and ranchers across the country? Well, we believe that there'll be very accelerated consolidation. Some say upwards of 40 or 45 percent consolidation of farmers and ranchers today, and I'll show you some of that modeling here in a minute. A widening gap between farmers that are independent or willing to surrender some of that independence. And I'll give you an example. At the Denver War Game, there were growers there that said, look, there is no way I'm going to allow any retailer or food company or processor to tell me how to farm on my land. I'll go down with this ship before anybody's going to tell me how to do what I know how to do. And they're absolutely right. They're going to go right down to the bottom of the ocean. There were other farmers there that said, I'll do whatever needs to be done. I'll comply. If I can make a profit, if I can keep growing, if I can keep doing what I love and I can build my business stronger and stronger, send me the specs. And I would argue that all of you are probably in that, that camp. That willingness to settle, that willingness to surrender, some of that prideful independence to make good business decisions is paramount through the course of the next two decades. We see the bifurcation of the farmer-rancher base. There's still going to be a lot of small farmers out there. We may call them hobby farmers who have off-farm income, 
that take advantage of consumer niches, that will continue to innovate and find opportunities in the market, and then there'll be these very, very large farmers. There'll be more accountability than ever before, more traceability and transparency standards than ever before. In order to navigate through to 2040, you have to have a high business IQ. You have to be adaptable. You have to be driven to market and position yourself with supply chains. You got to be collaborative and you got to be willing to surrender some independence. And I think a lot of the broader industry could learn from all of you in this room. So what does this mean? Who are the farmers of the future? Well, when we look back at the model, I mentioned that the independent elites and the enterprising business builders are having the most success today. We believe that they will continue to have more success. They already have the attributes necessary to navigate through the dynamics that are emerging over the next two decades. They are the entrepreneurial class that are driven to grow and succeed. And when you start to model that out over the next two decades, what we believe is that 71% of the farmer and rancher universe will have the attributes of the independent elites and the enterprising business builders. But that doesn't mean that everybody else goes away. The current leveraged lifestylers are probably gonna go away. But there could be some new ones, some new folks that get themselves in a difficult situation. The classic practitioners will probably break one way or another during the next two decades. There'll be a few of them left. The self-reliant traditionals that have saved money and put it in the bank and aren't trying to change, they're on a very slow, gradual glide slope to landing. Uh, so they'll stick it out for a while longer, but about 20% of the industry. So these entrepreneurs are the vast majority of the grower base that will survive in 2040 and continue to succeed. So what can we expect from them? Well, they're most certainly gonna have a global view. They're most certainly gonna be highly educated. They're definitely gonna be entrepreneurs and challenging conventional wisdom. They're gonna be innovators. They're certainly optimizers. And they're focused on getting an ROI from whoever they do business from. They have a plan, they have a long-term view, and they're looking for tools and technology that gives them a competitive advantage. There's gonna be a sea change, really, in that mindset over the next two decades. But there's one other dynamic that we gotta get our heads around, especially in the specialty crop area. These new models, urban agriculture, vertical agriculture, in almost every group I speak to, there's somewhat of a dismissive attitude towards these models. They'll never rival production ag, they'll never really challenge our market or our business. Well, I will tell you, for better or for worse, there are hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into these models. From venture funds, from technology companies, they are trying to create ecosystems that are very much aligned with what the agri-food value chain wants. Environments that almost use water perfectly, that require no chemicals, that have perfect conditions and perfect quality to the specification that a particular organization wants to buy. And oh, by the way, they're moved closer to urban centers where the people are moving and already there. So it's more efficient logistically too. Capital costs may be high, but what comes out of them is exactly what much of the industry is looking for. In my home state of Ohio, and in my hometown of Columbus, there's a small company called Wendy's, who two summers ago, with the stroke of a pen, it's run by one of my West Point classmates, by the way, stroke of a pen said, we're only buying hydroponic tomatoes from this point forward, for 6,000 stores, and that's a lot of burgers. These models are very consistent, and in your area, of the agri-food value chain, we need to contemplate what they mean and maybe even start to think if we can participate in these new models. I'll talk about it more here in a second. So what are the implications for your business? You all are the experts and I'm really uh, welcoming this offer, opportunity to learn more about the potato industry, but there are a few things that we can confidently predict. The first is there's gonna be continued consolidation. When we look at the census, 
you lost about 21% of the potato growers over the last uh, five years in that census. Continued tightening and clarifying of supply chains. You already on the cutting edge? It's going to continue to get tighter and harder and more differentiated. These food companies and retailers are going to change the requirements over time and, e and evolve them uh, in order to be able to make the marketing claims they want, in order to connect with millennial and Gen Z eating patterns and food preferences. They'll look for continued increased efficiency. They'll continue to try to drive the price point down, and they're going to try to reduce their risk by working with the, the supply and the suppliers, or the farmers in this case, that ultimately can meet their needs under ever-increasing scrutiny. Consumer demands will continue to evolve. I think there's opportunity in emerging markets, certainly opportunity in Africa if we can get our collective uh, actions more cohesive there. Other countries are already ahead of us in many ways. New genetic tools will give us opportunities. Connecting growers to premium markets will become important, even more important than it has in the past. So in general, for the industry, you're going to have to have a heightened awareness of where consumers are headed, more collaborative, collaboration, more flexibility, more adaptability, and more focus uh, on compliance at the agri-food value chain. But I don't want to leave this point without going back to the Nashville war game that I mentioned. On the left, you see some of the folks that participated. We had about 60 leaders in the room. And this happened in November two months ago. It was an alternative futures war game, where instead of trying to articulate what the dynamics of the future are, we projected likely scenarios and then tested the agri-food value chain's reactions and actions over particular time frames. And we learned a lot, and it's still being analyzed, but a couple high-level thoughts real quick. There is tremendous inefficiencies in agriculture whether we want to admit it or not. Tremendous inefficiencies. Those inefficiencies are making us ripe for disruption. There's a reason why so much venture money's flowing in to ag. We're ripe for disruption. We have to disrupt ourselves before we get disrupted. And so that was one of the clear outcomes, coming, key takeaways coming from Nashville just a couple months ago. Traceability, transparency, sustainability, the things you're already complying with, will continue to be imposed in ever-increasing ways on commodities that can't even contemplate it today, like corn, like soybeans. They can't even fathom, how are you going to trace a singular soybean through a system where we dump them all together? I'll tell you, it's coming. It's about food, not farms. This is one of the hardest revelations. I'll tell you that when push comes to shove, all of these parties that participated in this war game with finite resources, facing difficult situations, none of them invested in rural America. None of them tried to save struggling farms. They reinforced success. It's a nice thing to talk about, but in practice it's very difficult when resources are constrained. And so this very much becomes about food supply and not saving every farmer that's out there. And that's a difficult revelation. The supply chain gets shorter, and I will tell you, as I just did, the urban and vertical farming, this is a blind spot for the industry. It's coming, it's real, it is impactful, especially in specialty crops. It's an opportunity, though, for us if we want it. We need to think about what it means to us and not ignore it until it becomes so real. The amount of money flowing into it would stun you. Agriculture has seemingly conceded the consumer relationship. This played out very loud and clear on the game board. You can see the game board there, it's where we forced moves and constrained resources. We've kind of let the retailer and the food company own it. And guess what? They do own it. Many components of agriculture have no relationship to the end consumer. They have no effort to educate consumers. They have no effort to reach out to consumers or even learn from consumers. Most of the agri-food value chain has conceded that the retailers and the food companies own that relationship, and there's nothing agriculture is going to be able to do about it except comply. 
with whatever those Omni supply channels want. Something to think about. If we're going to let that continue to happen, then we need to think about what our, our future looks like and what our role is in these broader global supply chains. So what will the farmers of the future require? ROI, fast-moving, value-added agribusinesses that prove that they're providing a competitive advantage. Access to broader agri-food supply chains, to relationships, access to premium markets, streamlined processes, because these food companies are going to continue to push you on efficiency. And so the whole system needs to get more efficient. And while we tend to shift all that to you, I can tell you that there is a great deal of efficiency kind of downstream from you. So lots of opportunity there. Constant innovation and thinking outside the box. So where does this research go? I'll just bring it to conclusion here. What I just shared are kind of the highlights of foundational research. I hope that it resonated with you. I hope that you can put yourself into one of those categories or think about what it means to your future and what you can do to change or navigate it, the dynamics. But we have more work to do too. We're putting a global lens on Farmer of the Future in 2020. We have an inner circle, which is a board of advisors of organizations you know. Uh, that are part of thinking through where the blind spots are for farmers and ranchers, where the opportunities may be. There's ongoing analysis and more deep dives, but we also have a watch desk set up where we're constantly monitoring these dynamics that I outlined from the wargaming. Because the one thing for sure about predicting the future is some of it's going to be right and some of it's going to be wrong. We think it's pretty accurate. There's a lot of questions of when. Some things are happening faster. Some things will happen slower. Some things will happen differently. What's most important is that you have a unified view of that over the horizon battlefield and that you keep evolving it and keep clarifying it as we move down the track. And so that's what we're doing, monitoring those variables. And we would love your input into that process. And if we can share that information with you, uh, we welcome that opportunity too. And there's a war game every year. And I told some of your leaders last night at the reception that it's important that uh, the potato industry be there. And so we're hopeful uh, that in November of 2020 that uh, some of you are present at that war game in Nashville. Finally, we got to understand these consumers. If one dynamic was crystal clear, consumers become more and more impactful of what we do every day. And we have to take responsibility on the ag side of the chain to understanding that sooner and faster and not always just being in a reactionary mode to what the food and retailers and companies ultimately want from us. And so if any of you are going to be at NCFC next month, uh, I'll be presenting our next-gen consumer research uh, for your, uh, for hopefully for your thoughts and reaction. Finally, two thoughts. On the battlefield, the greatest gains and opportunities come when there's the most chaos, when what we call the fog of war for anybody that was in the military. The fog of war, when the bullets start flying, things get confusing, it's chaotic, but there's huge opportunity for gains. When I look at all this data, when I look at all this information, I see enormous opportunities for whoever wants to embrace adaptability and transparency and all these dynamics. For anybody that wants to get ahead, this is the time. This is when you can make meteoric leaps forward in your organizations and in your industry. I think there's enormous opportunities in the midst of the challenges that others are facing. And finally, the best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time. We have the opportunity today to continue to fight the close battle, continue to do the things you're doing on a daily basis to be successful, but every once in a while, start to think further over the horizon about what's coming, what that deep battle might look like, because it will be hugely instructive to you as to how you can navigate your business environment, how you can start to make decisions today that set the conditions for your competitive advantages and your success in the future. My guess is this is the group that are the most entrepreneurial in the potato industry you are also the leaders then 
that can have a role in setting the conditions of the future so that they are perfectly constrained in the ways we want for our advantage and to steer the industry in a direction that's very beneficial to our continued success. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of our research with you. I will be around all day, so I look forward to your feedback and your questions. And uh, I certainly welcome your thoughts on how we can evolve the research too. So thanks for your time, and thanks for what you do for agriculture and our collective national security.